Hey guys, Ozzy Expat here. In this video, I'm gonna talk about what does spending 10 times the amount of money on your home audio do for you? Okay, so I spent about 10 times more money on the audio in my home theater, not 10 times more on the whole setup, just an audio upgrade. And actually it was an audio upgrade rather than uh, say a, a replacement. So actually most of the value in the old system is still retained here. I am talking just audio. So the, the actual visual system has not been upgraded. I'm not talking about including chairs and any other aspect. I'm talking about just speakers. So what changed? My floor standings used to be these uh, Andrew Jones Pioneer FS51s. These things are very cheap. I think like 80 bucks each or something like that. The center channel was about 60 bucks and the bookshelves are over there. So that was my 5.1 setup combined with this big America F12s. These are um, uh, 12 inch subwoofers, um, but they're about 200 bucks. So they're still in my system, these things. So that was my 5.1 setup. I think the total price of that whole setup um, and then the receiver, and I'm, I haven't taken the receiver out, that's the same receiver. So the upgrade I'm gonna be talking about is really just speakers. Um, I think about $400, $450 for the subwoofers and then another $400 for the LCR and surrounds. So talking about $800. So what was upgraded? Well, I wanted a better floor standing. So I went with the Klipsch RF uh, 8000 uh, Gen 2s. Uh, I did consider the Gen 1s. I saw some good reviews for the Gen 2s. Maybe I would have been fine with the Gen 1s, but these were on sale. So I got these at a discount at about $1,500, no, $1,300 for the pair. So we're talking about spending about, you know, $150 for the original four standings over there, the Pioneers, and going to about $1,450 after tax, something like that for, for these floor standings. And then, you know, it was about $400 for the subwoofers here um, for, you know, $200 each, roughly that sort of the range. And so going to almost 10 times that, we've got um, $1,350 for each of these. So I guess not quite 10 times, but I, I do have two of them and I didn't throw the old ones away. So um, this is really a huge amount more money. And then the center channel wasn't that cheap, but it could have been more expensive. I went to the Gen 1s and Gen 2. I've got a separate video on that. So we're talking about close to about, eh, so it's about 3K, eh, about, about 3.5K, 4K worth of, um, of new speakers. We're not throwing out the old ones. These got relegated to be surrounds. Um, not super ideal, these would, you know, you'd like them to be higher and not actually at ear height. And uh, positioning over there is what it is. But basically, a lot more money spent. Uh, you know, it's it's an, another factor up. It's probably 5x rather than 10x, but it's still a huge amount. The next level up would really be, you know, $10,000 for the floor standings or 5,000, you know, multiple thousands of dollars just for the floor standings. But in my case, it was closer to like, uh, 1500 for the pair. So, you know, you, you can spend a lot more money, but I've definitely gone from a very competent budget setup with no restriction on size, as in, we're not talking about a sound bar or a satellite setup. We're talking about going from competent speakers, relatively sizable subs, although still budget. So going from a budget system to, I'd say a medium end system. So a respectable medium end, not extreme, although some would argue these subwoofers are extreme. There is another level up from here, I would say is the 15 inches. Um, but yeah, it's we're talking about that kind of money. And you know what? I didn't do any listening tests prior to getting them. I didn't know what I was gonna get. I just knew that, you know what? I'd spent 10 years with getting a lot of really good value out of the existing Pioneer system. And I thought, you know what? The way the world is, inflation and stuff like that, maybe I should spend some money on speakers, which, you know, they don't go out of date that easily. 
Um, they don't go out of date. The kind of thing that I see in the future just getting more expensive and they're not the kind of thing that actually, you know, gets quote unquote out of date. Now, I think subwoofers have improved, um, but you know, these were just released um, in the last 12 months. And so I think that's pretty good. They're pretty simplistic. So they're not gonna be up out of date from that perspective. I also spent some money getting a mini DSP over there and getting the whole UMIC one and getting the EQ happening and timing happening, so calibration. So a big step up in terms of calibration quality as well. But you couldn't really justify doing that level of calibration with this equipment here, because I mean, the, the components were like $1,000. Meanwhile, the mini DSP is like $140 plus some cabling. Uh, plus the UMIC one, which I've stored over there, which is, you know, there's you know, hundreds of dollars more just to devote to calibration when the system itself is like a few hundred dollars. So going up to this level, you're not just improving the speakers, you're also improving like how you calibrate the whole thing as well. And that, that's a big part of it too, it really is. I, I won't discount that at all. Um, but it's part of it, not, not a separate factor. Like, I don't think you could justify that kind of calibration for such a, for a budget system, although it would make a huge difference. In the end, I was really worried about getting for my money. What would I hear? Would I hear anything different? I'm pretty happy with the system as it was. And realistically, the, it was immediate, the, the difference. So in terms of the floor standings, these were remarkable. There was just so much more clarity and downright volume at the high end. At the high end, it just does not let up. So it's like I'm experiencing something brand new. The, the imaging and the sound stage was better. You know, if I sit in the dead center of my old system, it was okay. But all the positions other than dead center sound really, really good. And what I found was like, and I got sort of a mixed use space here. Um, what I found was when I listen to music, while well, I'm say over here cooking or something like that, when I listen to music with the old system, it wouldn't really fill the room. I don't know how to, to really describe this very well, um, but the, the system had subwoofers, it had speakers, and I never had to crank it up to like max or whatever. But from this position over here, which is not a listening position, music wouldn't be anything, wouldn't really be enjoyable here. So you would have to go over there to a listening position and that's where you could enjoy the music. But now if I just put the music up on the, on the system over there, I can enjoy it over here. Now I'm not, I didn't buy the system to listen to music while I'm cooking, okay? What I'm saying is what I'm hearing in terms of clarity is translating not just an improved experience in the main listening positions, but you also notice of it, notice it in, in the other parts of the room as well. So to me, I'm saying the listening positions have widened up a bit, clarity uh, and overall frequency response in the main listening position is also significantly much, much better to the extent I want to re-listen I want to, to listen to new movies all over again. Now with the subs, this was a really weird one. So I had to go on a bit of a journey with the subs. Now, now these are the most speculative. I mean, I always felt that these, these F12s, so having two of them, that my bass felt pretty even just from my ear. But having these in play, when I initially plugged them in, I kind of thought they weren't working. Now, it was definitely a psychoacoustic problem. What was happening was while I could feel the, the room actually shaking when I would use them, and that wasn't happening with the other ones, these things just go low and with tons of energy, I wasn't hearing the same like subwoofer tones that I was hearing before. And it was just, it was, to me, it was like, I'm, I'm missing something. I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing something. And I've got two of these and they're, they're rated for like 1800 watts each, which is more than the wall power. So I'm like, what is going on? Ultimately, it did take me pulling in the UMIC one, seeing what was happening on frequency response graph and then comparing it to these old ones. Basically, where I have to position these particular speakers in the room 
there's a bit of a gap at 50 to 70 hertz, which just so happens to be what these things were outputting before in similar positions, that these were actually generating all, only 50 to 70. So it was really a psychoacoustic thing where these completely filled out the sub range going down into the infrasonic range, you know, where you just feel it in your chest and nothing else, uh, earthquake generators. But the old system wasn't doing that, but it was doing something else. And that, th that something else was what I was still looking for. So ultimately, I invested in the, the mini DSP and the UMIC one to do better calibration. I got them in a, in a better position in the room so that gap wasn't as apparent. And importantly, I then plugged these guys back into the system in different positions so that they'll avoid that 50 to 70 range and fill that out. So in this journey, I've discovered that Okay, you can spend, you know, 10 times as much on the subs, but you still may want more subs. <laughs> so it is nice that I still get to use these subs. So with the mini DSP, I've got these basically doing a little bit of a fill in at 50 to 70 and it does work for that purpose. Um, however, the downside to mixing it like that is that while at listening volume, I do have these working well and filling out that frequency response range. I suspect if I start cranking this above my listening volume, which I tend to leave at about 75 dB, not full reference, like 85 or whatever. If I start cranking these to the point where I'm doing way above the listening volume, I haven't tested whether or not these will keep up. Now I haven't even tested these, right? But I suspect these are gonna hold, you know, in terms of distortion and, the sound quality and frequency response, I these won't keep up. These won't keep up. It's really that simple. The 50 to 70 range is much easier to keep up with, but I just there's just no way they've got an amp in there that's going to be able to do it and a driver that isn't going to distort. That being is pretty pretty low frequency. So there's a trade-off there, um, but that is what I've learned with the, the subtones is that you, you can end up developing an ear for how your sub works and then you go to something that's genuinely better and then it's like, where's the subtones? So that was eye-opening. I find that the, the increased range underneath 50 Hertz for these systems is, for the, for the subs, has changed how much immersion is coming from particular movies. Now, not every movie actually does well below 50 Hertz. Um, Top Gun 2, for example, is a bit of a disappointment. Not much special happening there in the sub, sub region. Um, but all of the Godzilla movies are just completely insane on the system. And so that's revealed the next part. I won't get into that just yet, but yeah, basically these are absolutely phenomenal. There's no substitute for it. Everything that I used to in the past, say Chemical Brothers Surrender or something like that, and that would just be like a torture test for those systems. These things just, like, just laughs at it. There's an unlimited range now on, on, on the subwoofer level. Um, the center channel, I actually uh, stayed with the Pioneer ones for about a month, thinking that the center channel doesn't do much, sort of like dialogue. I don't really think that the Pioneers were that bad at say, just people talking. But in purchasing this eventually. So these were on sale, $450 versus $800 for the Gen 2. What I found was that the center channel isn't just a dialogue channel. And <laughs> what movie really, well, one movie was really tough. Like we had the new system, had the neighbors over, and the new movie that came out was Elvis. And that's a lot of singing. It's a, you know, effectively a musical. The big problem there was that, the big problem there was that the center channel was really where all the audio, the vocals for Elvis was coming from. And it just was completely lackluster. I'm listening to, at that point you were listening to a $60 center channel and not much else, quite frankly. Um, I also learned a lot about bass management and how finicky the receiver is. So I've got an older Onkyo um, pre Atmos, but I did flash it to be able to do Atmos and, you know, because it's now a 7.1 system and very, very finicky with bass management. I always thought that the listening, the best listening mode was to do 
uh, direct. And that sounds correct, right? It was like direct, like I got 7.1 channels, I want seven channels out or something like that. And I, I was aware, made aware that there is a bypass mode on some receivers, which means that you completely bypass base management, you go input to output. And I did see this mode, the bypass mode in the system. And there are a lot of other systems which imply sort of basically upmixing, say DTSX Neo and things like that, which I'm like, no, nah, I don't need any of that. I just direct sounds fine. But the reality of direct is direct on the Onkyo is the bypass mode. So I was actually listening to a lot of new things in in bypass, so bypassing base management. So the only uh, base being produced was from, for the main channels, was coming from the floor standings, which um, these are okay, but the, the Klipsch lineup is really designed to be used with a subwoofer, which is completely what I think you should do. Like my opinion for a home theater, you, you just default, there should be a sub. Don't worry about how, how much below, you know, 100 hertz your floor standings can do, because you, you're gonna have subs and you're gonna use base management. So that was very annoying. Um, so I've discovered you've got to put it in multi-channel mode, but this multi-channel mode is named differently uh, and set differently. So it's a different setting. So you have to go through all of your inputs, set it to multi-channel mode, not just for the input, but for every source material. So if you go to like Dolby Digital or Stereo or something like that, you got to you got to change it. And the name changes like on, on two-channel input from my Fire TV, it'll be called stereo, while on, say, uh, Atmos, it'll be called multi-channel, as completely bewildering in terms of what exactly is happening there. So, but going with the, with the center channel, what I discovered was it was far, far more than just dialogue, and it was really a lot of high frequency special effects. So whenever there's something on screen that has a special effect like lightning strikes or you know something high pitched or whines or the tinkling of brass coming out of a gun and hitting concrete or something like that, all of those sounds are appearing in the center channel. So I found that there was sort of this new found, not just sort of like Elvis, where someone's singing out of the center channel, which is not that common for any movie, honestly. Um, but a lot of special effects, so, so sound effects, were often played out of the center channel and not the left and right. So I always thought it was the other way around. There's a lot happening on the center channel. It's totally worth the investment. I completely was sort of like, I was ignoring, I was like, maybe I don't need a, a new center channel, it's just dialogue. No, absolutely. With the special effects, it makes a huge difference. And last but not least is content. So I always already knew there was a large difference between streaming and Blu-ray. Um, for example, if you, I saw Master and Commander, Far Side of the World, I've always had the Blu-ray of it. And I saw it on Amazon streaming one day and I played it. I'm like, this completely sucks. This completely blows. It was like there's no dynamics it just doesn't sound like i'm in the ship while on the blu-ray it sounds like i'm in the ship even if a 5.1 system and budget system it sounds like you're on the ship um so very immersive but you go to streaming and it's just terrible so there's already this huge rift between streaming and non-streaming with and I could already hear that on the budget system. So I'd say even if you're in a budget system, anything that's like a true 5.1 where you actually have reasonable subs happening, you gotta go to Blu-ray, you know? You gotta, you just have to. It's just everything below, the streaming audio, it just sucks. It just completely sucks. Um, I urge you to try it. If you can't tell the difference between your favorite movie on Blu-ray versus streaming, then okay, fine, go ahead, don't, don't, don't worry about it. You don't have a system or an ear that could potentially hear it, but it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much. There just isn't much surround separation from LCRs, so you don't have the things got whizzing by on surround. It's just effectively, it's not surround anymore. And the low end, the sub end, it just just basically disappears on, on the streaming. So yeah, just if you can't tell the difference and you're happy with it, fine stick to streaming otherwise you really got to step up to the blu-ray as soon as you've got a reasonable 5.1 system once you step up to a lot more money like this system i think you really really need to be uh, well 
given 100% on Blu-ray, but it really exposes the difference between really, say, good Blu-rays and the ones that are truly exceptional. So an example of like that would be, say, the difference between... Mm, see, even Top Gun 2 is not a really good example because I, I think that sort of verges on being mediocre. I could hear the differences between, say, Top Gun 1 and Top Gun 2. Top Gun One's way better on even the budget system. But say, for example, Finding Nemo. Finding Nemo on Blu-ray is really incredible. Like, they're doing a lot of underwater stuff, so there's a lot of real subwoofer, immersive sort of tones, like bloop, 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 sort of type type sounds as you know like turtles swim, swim by and stuff like that and you only really get full immersion if you've got full bandwidth on on those you know low frequency effects and stuff like that and so if you have a subwoofer that isn't really giving that much detail in it i don't think it's as immersive and so so that was the really big game changer with this system is like the while i got a lot of enjoyment out of the last system certainly a lot the immersion of a full range system like the way that it is now where it goes into the infrasonics where it shakes your seed and you got every frequency at, at a very flat frequency response while on my previous system everything above 3000 hertz starts tailing off pretty quickly and everything below 50 hertz is just dead um, it's a lot more immersive it feels like you're in the fish tank with the fish and finding nemo so this but that's not for every movie it's not like every single movie has this next level lift with the more expensive system i find that some movies they're ho-hum other movies they just completely blow you out of your seat and you're in another world with the system and that never happened before in my old system so unfortunately it's very content dependent and it's really hard to tell which content will or won't have that level of immersion. And it isn't as simple as, oh, if it's got Dolby Atmos, it's gonna be good. That's absolutely not true. As I said in this example, Top Gun 2 is actually pretty mediocre. Finding Nemo, I think is 7.1, but not Atmos. And so the 7.1 track on that is just incredible. I think it's 7.1, it might even be 5.1, but it doesn't matter, it's just full range. It's very, very immersive. So there's no, um, formula for finding content so one you have to start on blu-ray but then who's actually making the best soundtracks like i was blown away by finding nemo early so i went out and bought all the pixar movies because animation normally they have a lot of time to be able to handle the the audio and while most pixar movies do sound really good none of them sound as good as finding nemo i did look up who was responsible for it and there's a, a guy who worked at lucas sound and he was responsible for finding nemo and yeah he has a few credits to his name that also sound absolutely incredible but you know sometimes they don't as well so there's no silver bullet for like how do i know this particular experience is going to be at that next level that the system is capable of so it tells me that like source material is like very, very important and there's no guarantee which ones are good. Like all the new Marvel films, they're terrible. You know, it, it's, it's not about whether it's new, it's where, whether or not the attention is paid to the sound. All the Godzilla films from Godzilla 2014, uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters and, and Kong versus Godzilla, those are unbelievable. Just completely other world experiences watching those movies. But, you know, I've only got about 20 discs, which I say are about at that sort of next level out of about 300. Everything else is like super enjoyable, but they don't get to that next level. So in reality, I'd say spending a lot of money may get you a, a completely game-changing experience in certain content. And then in others, it's just like whatever. Um, so if you're sticking to streaming, do not spend any money on audio. I could hear the difference between streaming and Blu-ray just from, just with my budget system. But I was already onto the Blu-ray bandwagon, so it means that I, I was starting a good starting point to be able to hear the differences and experience the differences. And it's not subtle, as I said, it changed the movies from being sounding good, sounding fun, to completely immersive. And that's the main difference I'm talking about. So overall, I'd say 
it was very very good next step would be atmos height channels but out of say 300 discs i've got about 20 that i'd identify as being really good really immersive discs you know movies that really push you to the next level you're, you're in there in the movie experiencing something new for the first time even though it might be the fifth time you've watched it maybe 10 of those are actually atmos discs and maybe out of those 10 they use the atmos height channels very very well who knows maybe five maybe two maybe one maybe all 10 but we are talking about a such a sliver of content that's actually coming out that is actually worthy of your audio system it's, it's very very limited and in terms of just straight music straight music listening i don't think you need to go up to this level like certainly not on the subwoofers there just isn't that much subwoofer content in music itself um, but on that note i did find that amazon music is probably the best lossless audio streaming service but their Fire TV app is like pre-alpha quality, but audio quality wise, um, definitely Amazon Prime Audio is doing a really good job, but a little hard to navigate and certainly not as game changing as movies were in upgrading the system. Would I get this system only for audio, only for music? Eh, probably not. But you know, most of us don't have to make that choice where they're saying, oh, this is only for two channel music or something like that. All right, those are my thoughts. Um, until next time, see you around.